Well, Jim, I may have deafened you, as you put it, but were you blinded this week by the wrestling that was on TV, specifically on Wednesday night? <sighs> blinded by the light. Ripped off like a deuce, another runner in the night. Um, it always sounds like douche when you hear that song. Well, it, it, it only when Manfred Mann did it. Now, he was a little looser with the uh, the phrasing. But uh, it, the news was bad there, too. It was a bad show with bad news. We start out with Brian Danielson. That's always a positive thing. That's always a winner. I dare him not to dress like he just changed his oil. None of these guys will dress like stars. But, okay, here comes Danielson. And he plugs the pay-per-view. And he plugs blood and guts. And all is exciting. And all is smiles. And then he says, I was. And he got the first word in there. And people kind of went, Ooh. I was looking forward to Zack Sabre Jr. I was excited about blood and guts to get at Chris Jericho and his flaccid crew of coxmen. I got to say one thing. That is the first time and probably will be the last time that we hear the phrase flaccid crew of coxmen on a wrestling <laughs> program. And I love it. Brian, you just, you topped me when I called Shawn Michaels a fornicator on Raw in 1996. But... There was good news and bad news with this promo, and the bad news he led with, he's not cleared to compete at either one of these programs because of Chris, what Chris Jericho and Jake Hager did at the garbage 10-man assholes in the arena match or whatever it was they called it. So he finished strong. He's talking about overcoming all of the injuries that he's overcome before, and he'll do it again. But Brian, before I get into the good news that he announced, did you detect, I mean, obviously he, he didn't want to be given this announcement. He doesn't want to be pulling out of these matches. He doesn't want to be having to say that, but it's true. So he has to, but did you detect at that point that he was starting to, sometimes guys fire up because it's called for in the promo. And sometimes guys fire up because they're desperately trying to sell the unsellable in a positive fashion to the fans. I think he was trying to make his exuberism and enthusiasm, exuberism, that's a dusty, exuberance and enthusiasm be infectious to the people, but they were still like, oh, fuck, now he's out. Did you kind of, could you, did you get that vibe is what I'm asking. I think people were pretty deflated once they realized what, where the promo was going, and then once he started saying these things, and he tried to put a nice spin on it and say, I'll be back soon, but I won't be at the pay-per-view or Blood and Guts, which seemingly is this coming week, I guess? Well, no, well, the pay-per-view is this weekend, as we're, and then the, the Blood and Guts is a free TV show. That's this Wednesday, right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't realize it was coming up right after the pay-per-view for some reason. Well, why wouldn't it? So then he says, but there's good news. I mean, how are we going to get out of this with good news? He's found the one person that he trusts to take his place who can wrestle and fight. We will be astounded. They really promised us the moon, but he won't tell us who it is. And he said, because I came out of the bad guy tunnel. I wish he wouldn't give the little smart nod, but we're going to find out Sunday who the replacement is. Some people are saying it's Claudia Cesaro. He would fit the guy that can technically wrestle excellently. He can fit a guy that can fight. I don't know if he if we're going to be astounded. I don't know if AEW needs another WWE guy. Well, but I mean, as it, good as he is, don't blame Claudio because he took the job. He's he doesn't have the he doesn't have the WWE mindset. He wasn't trained there. Hopefully, he doesn't have any of the stink on him, and he's learned some good things without learning the bad things. But, you know, anyway, I'm not sure this made it to chicken salad. They were trying to make chicken salad out of chicken shit. I'm not sure this made it. But as, as Danielson finished, here comes Zack Sabre Jr., who I have never seen before, but I've heard the name. It's a name that sticks with you. We just heard his promo on the drive-thru. Right. Well, also, I mean, I've heard of him reading results and on the internet, etc. I've heard the name for a while, Zack Sabre Jr., I never heard of Zack Sabre Sr. He must not have got over. But here comes Zack Sabre Jr., and at least he was dressed for television. 
he looked quite nifty in his outfit, but he looks like another generic 20-something-year-old male model guy with a generic haircut. I've heard he can wrestle. Will we be uh, pleasantly surprised when we see him? Do you know anything about him? I've seen him. He's very, very talented, and I think the biggest issue I've had with him is just he's so skinny. Now, I haven't seen him in a few years, so we'll see how he looks, but... He was a really, really good, serious in-ring wrestler who was just very, very skinny. And sometimes that, you know, affects the way you see someone. Well, he had the suit on, so we can't tell. But I don't know. Adam Cole, later on, he looked skinny in a suit. Well, he didn't have a suit, but he had clothes on. Fuck, if he had bricks in his pockets, I, now I don't know if he'd weigh 170. Looks like he's wearing his older brother's clothes. <laughs> the, the leather jacket. Uh, anyway. So Moxley did a promo backstage, same shit. Then we had a six-man tag. It was Pockets with his buddy Trent and their friend Rocky Romero. What has he done to deserve having to get stuck in this situation against Will Ostrich, Kyle Fletcher, and Mark Davis? So we've got unknowns versus jobbers. And as I was sitting there, I said, look, think about this. There's Osprey, there's Fletcher, there's Davis, there's Pockets. There's half these guys look like the cast of Saved by the Bell. What it they're people we never saw till last week, or we haven't seen regularly in the case of Trent and Romero, and of course we've seen way too much of the mascot. So they on Speed's on-screen speed search told me this went for a while. Did you watch this match? I watched it in part. I mean, I wasn't very interested just because I'm interested in Osprey, and I really liked Aussie Open when we saw them last week in that six-man match. I think that's what it was. But I have no interest in Orange Cassidy, and I may have even less interest in Trent and Rocky Romero as Rapungi Vice. I tried no to interest. watch... I tried to watch Osprey last week because they said he was the greatest wrestler in the world and he didn't really do anything in that match. And I would have tried again here to see if he did anything, but as you mentioned, Pockets was in it. On-screen speed search told me that the mascot is still doing the same joke and it's still embarrassing. And a lot of people are saying about Pockets, well, but when he actually does wrestle, he can really go. Well, besides the fact that you can train a chimpanzee to imitate human mannerisms, but they don't understand why they're doing it, if Pockets does any wrestling move properly to another professional wrestler, it's just a joke sack of shit doing wrestling moves well, which devalues the entire business. So what he needs to do is go the fuck far away as he can. So, and they, again... We've seen Austri, Austri, Ostrich, Osprey, whatever the fuck his name is. We've seen him twice. And they want people to think that he's a great wrestler. They put him in six mans. They put him against these fucking joke opponents. Why do they expect people to take him seriously as a top guy when he's playing with children in a parody of an independent wrestling match? So... They did a bunch of stuff at a high rate of speed, even if it wasn't on speed search. And then, after they did every move that's ever been invented multiple times, Pockets punched one of Mr. Belding's favorite students and pinned him one, two, three. So after every bump ever, an emaciated Valvoline employee gets the, the win with a fake Roman Reigns impersonation. And then after the match, here comes Jeff Cobb, and Grado Khan, and they've got their tag belts with them from another cup. They've got everybody on this program now has a belt, a title belt of some kind. Ring of Honor, AEW, TBS, TNT, New Japan. Now it's five on three. The heels have the baby faces outnumbered, but then music, FTR. And I wrote, oh, fuck no. It was FTR's job to come down to the ring and back up the Lollipop Guild and the heels who were on the apron of the ring just jumped down and there was no violence, no confrontation. It's just, oh, well, we got up because we had more of you or more of us than you did. Now the odds are even, so we're going to get down. 
The only pleasant thing about this segment was Dax was wearing a Loverboy Dennis Condry t-shirt. Otherwise, it, Brian, a lot of people we don't know and don't care about doing shit that we don't understand. Did that sum this up? Yeah. I mean, I don't know why anyone would care about any of this. I think Osprey and Aussie Open are talented, and we just saw them all of a sudden on TV, and I don't think the viewers necessarily care so much right away. And you're a lot more lenient than me, I guess. I'm disappointed that they have FTR involved with Orange Cassidy in this. That's what, shit. yes. I'm I think this just, is Tony Khan fucking doing stupid stuff, and uh, it's unnecessary because they're so over right now. They get a big pop every time they come out. People want to see them work. Oh, they just had a, on one of the programs they taped for airing somewhere that nobody watches them. Cash Wheeler now gets beat by one of the New Japan guys. They've, they've got guys they're bringing in that not even under contract, and they're taking top guys in their own company that are signed to long-term contracts that are also currently champions in another division and having them do jobs to fill in talent. So then, Sanjay Dutt, Jay Lethal, and Satnam Singh were in the hallway in the back where great talent goes to be forgotten about. And Lethal wants to face Samoa Joe for the Ring of Honor TV title, but Joe is still apparently injured. Uh, another for the injured list. And Jay Lethal did a great promo like he does every time, like because he should be a top guy here, but he's being booked into oblivion if you ever see him. And the excuse is, oh, the Indian audience. The audience over there, not I'm not talking about the Navajos or the Apaches. I'm talking about in India. They're going to love him. We'd like to see some of him here instead of the fucking clown show that you present most of the time. Then came the only reason that anything on television gave me this week to live and breathe, Brian. One of the single greatest performances that I've seen in years. It, we know that Christian Cage is a talented veteran. He can work and he can talk. He hasn't had the opportunity to do really either in the past year or so since he's been in the corner of Dino Dimwit and Jungle Boy. When he was presented as a babyface, his work is still good, but I don't think his promos are as good as when he's a heel. But now that he's switched heel, and now that he knows that a lot of the top talent is out injured, and his talents may be needed, the team is in need, we got to step up and do something entertaining. Christian Cage came out here and did the best 10-minute fucking interview that I've seen in I don't know how long. I liked the MJF Meltdown promo, which was a completely different genre of promo as this and completely different topic, the whole nine yards, for a heel promo by a heel that's just turned, that wants to get the people on his ass and wants to get some heat verbally. This was one of the best performances I've seen in forever. From the start, he was on the people it, he, it was an interview that Tony Schiavone held the microphone for, which was even more amazing that Christian did this effortlessly and like you used to be able to do with the announcer of the show holding the microphone for you. It, the material was fantastic. The delivery was incredible. The only thing that was lackluster was Tony, the... Booker of the Year forgot to actually come up with a reason why that Christian turned on Jungle Boy, so they blamed it on Jungle Boy eliminating Christian from a battle royal last year. And he's mad at the fans because they cheered. And since then, it's been a plot to take all of Jungle Boy's money. I'm thinking Christian has a short fuse. He gets pissed off nine months ago and he finally does something about it. But he did a great promo with the worst reason for a turn ever in wrestling. And he gave shit to social media and the losers tweeting, blistering the fans. He was so genuine. It came off so flippantly, everything he'd say. And the whole story, we wanted to leech off Jungle Boy because he came back here to make money. He doesn't want to get young talent over 
He doesn't want to impart his knowledge to the next generation. He wants to make some fucking money. And he put himself all over, the, over all of the kids. Eat my crumbs and enjoy it. And this was a promo also that referred to smart subjects, but didn't violate kayfabe. If you knew, you knew. And if you didn't, it didn't slap you in the face. And now he's the guy. Remember, he came in his his catchphrase was going to be he was going to be the guy that outworks everyone. Well, now he says, now I got to get my own hands dirty and that pisses me off. And that's great because nobody they want to see a lazy fucking heel that doesn't want to have to do his own work. I don't know what outwork everyone even ever meant, and they they dropped it quickly, thankfully. And then he tells the video of him telling Jungle Boy's mother that she raised a piece of shit and then comes back to him and he says that Jungle Boy's mother was sweet on him being Christian because she wanted Christian to be Jungle Boy's father. After all, he had one, but he's dead. Oh, I wrote down, this is the greatest heel promo in years. And then they play music, and it's not Jungle Boy. It's the fucking dinosaur. And he comes out and snatches Christian by the neck. And then it started trailing down for me, because Christian says, remember what happened to Marco? Well, if anything bad happened to Marco Stunt, a.k.a. Dwarf Dong Sucker, I'd like to hear about it, but it's cluttering things up here. And then Christian says, you're like a son to me. We got to talk in private, not in front of these people. And they hug, and Christian smiles over behind his back, and they walk off. But I love the promo, and I love the idea we're going to see Christian Cage against Jungle Boy, because as we've mentioned... Jungle Boy's the shits when he's in with the indie guys because he doesn't know how to lead on his own, but when he's got a veteran like that who can play to Jungle Boy's strengths, his selling and his purdy face, and you don't want to see that young, purdy little boy get the shit kicked out of him, that will be a great match. But anything that the dinosaur is in is going to drag this down, make it look fake or hokey or just goofy, the guy has no instincts. He can't talk realistically, work realistically, or have the proper reactions. So I hope that he's not going to be an integral part of this. What do you think? I thought it was a tremendous promo. I thought it was really good. I didn't think it was going to be as good as it was, and it was good. I thought it went a little too long, but it doesn't take anything away from it. Maybe the most, I was going to say low-key, but it really wasn't low-key. The low-key best part of this was the outfit. The turtleneck. <laughs> he looked like such a heel. He looked like such a prick. We'll see where they go with Luchasaurus. I'm not going to shoot it down just because of that. Because I don't know where they're going to go. Maybe he loses the dinosaur mask. Who knows? Probably not. I bet he looks like a complete fucking dipshit under the mask. But this took forever to get him to the turn. I'm glad at least once he's turned, now I'm interested. And I would like to see him against Jungle Boy, and you laid it out there. We've seen Jungle Boy work with other guys like Jericho and different guys. Christian might be the guy who gets the best match out of him. I think he will be, because Christian's been there, and he knows how to fucking help a guy in the ring. Um, and, and that's the thing. Everything, Christian was not in charge of the booking, which is why the turn has no sensible reason and why it took so long and they were broadcasting it to the point where it wasn't a surprise because, you know, when you when you drop little breadcrumbs or leave little hints, they're not supposed to be the entire combination to the safe, right? It's supposed to be a hint, not here's every piece of information you need to predict the future. So anyway, I hope that, uh, but uh, Christian didn't have control over that but when you send him out to the ring to work or to talk he's got a certain amount of control over what he says and how he delivers it and what the match is maybe not the finish so anything the point i'm making is when you get guys like christian or like mjf or like punk or like several other people that we talk about that know what to do and are talented they can have great moments great segments, great matches. It's just, 
they're the ones I feel the worst for because they don't have a booker to actually put the proper framework and structure and logic and sense and continuity around their individual good performances. They get, they put in great performances when it's not related to the booking. When it's related to the booking, there's somebody else involved that doesn't know what they're doing, and that brings it down significantly. So I feel bad for the guys who can perform and hold their end up because they're the ones that are being shorted. The other guys, they can't work, and they have these shitty indie matches. It doesn't matter whether the booking makes any sense or not because they ain't going to get over. Hey, looking back now, and I think we've gone a couple different ways during the last few years, but the return of Edge and the return of Christian, for a while it seemed like, well, Edge is being used kind of all right. Christian and not doing anything with. Now look at where we are. The worm has suddenly turned. 25 years ago, I think it was, their first tryout match. It had to be, if, if, if it wasn't in 97, it was in 96, but I think it was 97. In Toronto, they worked with each other. And JR had signed them for like 300 bucks a week Canadian money on a developmental deal, right? <laughs> and I start putting them both over. And JR got shh, because Carl DeMarco, the head of the Canadian WWE office, Bret Hart's friend and sometimes agent, uh, he was, you know, in charge of a lot of the Canadian talent and or whatever. He knew the guys. He had pitched them. And as I'm putting them over, JR says, shh, and he walks me over to the corner of the grill position. He says, kayfabe DeMarco, we got him for 300 bucks Canadian a week. So, well, you're going to have to give them a raise sometime because they're good. Speaking of people that aren't good, the next match was Malachi Black against Penthouse. And I don't need to tell you anything more, but that was the match, and the referee was Rick Knox, the corpse ref. So this was again on fast-forward on-screen speed search, but the highlight of the thing, I had to stop this and time this. They got on the apron and they did some ridiculous, contrived, slow motion back and forth. I'm going to give you a move on the apron. No, you're going to give me one. No, I'm going to block it and T's giving you one. They're in front of the referee counting them on the apron, right, Brian? And they're there for 45 seconds and Knox got to six. These guys are both just fucking rotten. It's unredeemable. They're always going to do something in the match that's fucking rotten. There was something redeemable here. What? We had recorded the drive through a couple days earlier, and there was a song about Malachi Black to the tune of Paint It Black. And when I was watching it come out there, I couldn't <laughs> stop laughing at the idea he has tree branches on his head, and the lights go off, and they come <laughs> on, and they go off, and they come on. <laughs> I can't look at this guy and not laugh. Wait a minute, those aren't tree br I thought those were r reindeer horns. I'm, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, but how do you take this guy seriously? He believes in this. He thinks he's doing really good stuff. He doesn't realize how hokey and bad it is. And therein lies the problem. You got a guy letting the other, the wrestlers have their creative freedom. And now you're finding out what happens when a lot of wrestlers get creative freedom and no experienced, legitimate booker matchmaker is in charge of putting it all together. So then we got to see the hangman again. Did you know hangman Adam Page, Brian, has blocked me on Twitter? Yeah, I remember we discovered that a little while back. We had to look for something, and he blocked you. That's and he blocked right. me That's as well. Right. That's, That's right. right. Well, listen, somebody else sent me something where the page had said, and and it, that's why. Oh, that's what it was because Page apparently was talking about something Booker T had said because Booker T made fun of Adam Cole's diminishing physique, and so. But when Page said something about old people with podcasts, everybody thought it was me, and they tried to send me the. The thing, but of course it doesn't show up on mine because I'm blocked, but that's why another reason I twin tr I twinded. I trended on Twitter last week or whenever because Oh god damn. So anyway, Adam pa Adam Page basically is a uh, not only a fake cowboy, but apparently a very easily insulted and feeling hurt whiny little bitch. Also. 
So he wrestles Silas Young, the last real man who's actually from Milwaukee and worked for Ring of Honor, so he's probably getting a look-see. They put Adam Cole on color because he can't wrestle. He's wearing the black leather jacket and the what looks like women's yoga pants now because they're tight on his bird legs. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, did you hear that Adam Cole recently won a big legal fight? Legal fight? No, I hadn't heard anything yeah, about that. He sued both his legs for non-support and oh, won. Come on, come on. Um, <laughs> I, I like Adam. How many times I said great shit about Adam? He goes there and the whole thing falls in a hole. And now it's summertime. I know he's injured. He was wearing street clothes. I don't expect him to look like Lex Luger while he's out hurt, but he hasn't seen the sun in a year and a half. How it's summertime. Does he go for, I have a tan from going out in the yard with my limb lopper. So they had a match page and Silas young and page did the blind moonsault off the top again, like he does in every match perfectly. Despite the fact that he took his eyes off his opponent for 16 seconds by my count, they go to the break, they come back. The first move back from the break is Paige superplexes Silas Young off the top rope. And in this case, they both actually sell it and nobody even goes for a cover. Remember, they'll do the superplex where they'll land and the one guy will put his legs up and the other guy will fucking hook them, which kills the superplex. In this case, the guy that gave the superplex sold it as long as the guy that took it. Nobody even went for a cover. And then Silas Young, who looks like a wrestler, but tried and succeeded in doing a flip, did a triple Lindy flip out of a handstand on the top rope and landed on his feet because Paige had moved. So literally, Silas Young does a headstand on the top rope, bounces off of that, lands with his ass on the top rope, does a backflip, lands on his feet, and Paige just German suplexes him. Close lines him, hits him with a buckshot lariat. One, two, three, thanks for showing up. And then Adam Cole comes to the entranceway with the microphone, and apparently he's going to talk to Paige. But here comes Sling Blade Jay White, and he interrupts. And remember, he is Adam Cole's friend. Cole said, Here's my friend Jay White, and they're friends. Well, as they were standing there looking at each other, Brian, did you notice that Adam Cole and Sling Blade Jay White look like brothers? Both have a beard. Both have dark hair. Both have hair pulled back in a fucking ponytail or a bun or something. Both of them are wearing a jacket with kind of flousy fucking sleeves. And they both look like if they turn sideways and stick their tongue out, they look like a zipper. They're about 170 pounds piece and approximately the same height. So, and as slovenly dressed as Adam Cole is, Sling Blade Jay White is also slovenly dressed. So now we've got two unkempt 170 pounders with ponytails doing wrestling promos at each other. It looks like a cable access show where the fans get to come up and do wrestling promos. Who is approving what these guys wear on television? Anybody? Nobody. How the fuck can that be? Have you seen what Tony's been wearing? Well, he's not on TV. I don't care if he comes in his pajamas, which he probably does instead of other female oh, well, parts, but stop nevertheless it. stop it i'm just i just it was there it was there i had to take instead it. of other female anatomy parts <laughs> but seriously nobody is telling these guys you look like a fucking moron you look like a goddamn repairman you look like the jiffy lube guy you're supposed to be a television star unless it's your gimmick if your gimmick is uh, the the Godwins or a hillbilly or whatever the fuck. Everybody's wearing sweatpants or these tight jeans, a fucking t-shirt, a frousy fucking jacket, if that. The same hair, just pull it back and put a fucking rubber band around it. They look like people on a fucking street. And I didn't usually have to critique what guys were wearing on television when I was in charge of any company, 
anywhere because most of the time they knew they're stars on television. They're going to go out in their tights and they're going to be oiled and they're going to be tanned. They're going to look good. Or they're going to be out in street clothes. They need to fuck unless it fits their gimmick. They need to be dressed up like they're somebody. And if you did have to tell somebody, you didn't have to generally tell them more than once. So again, this is why that this looks so amateur. And why when you leave these guys to their own devices, the WWE looks like a professional network organization. And this looks like local television. Not the production, the content. So... Sling Blade's out there, and he ain't going to fight Adam Cole because Adam Cole lost to Paige. So then Jay White just tells Paige, or tells Cole he's not going to fight him because you lost to him twice, and walks to the ring and leaves Adam Cole standing there. Now they've got Jay White, a guy that's not even signed to a full-time contract or exclusive contract of the company that's just told off Adam Cole and left him standing there with no rebuttal, like a lost child on a street corner while he walks to the ring and he's going to tell Paige off. But they get in a fight and then Adam Cole comes in and nut shots Paige and they both get heat on Paige. But then Cole teases hitting White with the title belt, but White catches him and suddenly they play music again. And then here comes a blonde Japanese guy in t-shirt and sweatpants that looks like a fucking Japanese M&M. And it's, it's Okada, supposedly one of their top guys in all of New Japan, who looks like a fucking parking attendant. And he gets in the ring, and Okada and Paige have a sloppy fight with the heels and then stare at each other like they're going to fight, but then they turn around and go back to fighting the heels. So Jay Slingblade White is supposed to be the world champion of New Japan Pro Wrestling. He looks like Ned, with a scraggly, unkempt beard, pulled back hair, and he doesn't look any bigger than fucking Adam Cole. Oh, yes, he does. Not much. I'm talking body weight, not height. And then Okada, with the bad bleach job for no reason, and they had a sloppy fight. When do any of the, when, how is this designed for any of these people that we have not seen on the television before to make an impact and an impression on people seeing them for the first time? We have seen countless people debut on the show in street clothes, well, Will Ospreay wore a robe, I'll give him credit, but in street clothes, just coming out there while Excalibur screams their name, and Excalibur is not an effective commentator unless you're in on whatever he's doing. Then he's just yelling names, you have no idea what he's even saying. I wouldn't have done any of this stuff if I was building up an interpromotional pay-per-view at New Japan. This is not the way I would have done anything. What's Okada's two greatest moves in a wrestling match? Do you have any idea? Uh, well, the Rainmaker is his biggest move, and that's like his short arm lariat. So I would say that's his biggest one. He's got two good moves, right? Yes, everyone has at least two okay, good moves. Okay, then here's what you do. Goddamn Adam Cole and Jay Slingblade White have their issues amongst themselves. They've said they're friends, but also they're being pissy with each other, and White ain't going to fight Cole, but Cole still doesn't like Paige. So when White and Paige get in the fight, then fucking Cole comes in, nut shots Paige from behind, and both the heels get on this motherfucker, and they've got him set up to where they're going to give a double fucking paralyzing move to goddamn old poor old Adam Page and without music or play the music but let him run in tights and boots if he's got a physique couldn't look any worse than he did in those street clothes here comes Okada he hits the ring and he gives one of his big moves to Cole and he gives the other big move to fucking White and looks like a world beater and goddamn the heels scamper out on the floor and with shock on their face, oh my God, he's here, so it makes a big deal to them. And the guy looks like he can do something, and we don't have time to see through the fact that he can't do a lot of this other stuff because the fight was sloppy as shit. 
and he's made an impact, and he looks like somebody. Instead, we get sloppy fights, street clothes, nobody understands, they're, they're for each other, they're against each other, they're on each other's side, what the fuck? But none of these people are coming out and being put in a spotlight to make a statement or an impact or have a 30-second flurry where they are the center of attention and they look better than everybody else. And that's the only way that you debut somebody on a surprise run-in and get them over. Elsewise, it's just these guys have staggered out there for a personal appearance in the fucking ring. Who gives a shit? Red Velvet, as we mentioned, is injured, but old uh, Malcolm Bivens, or what's his name now? Stokely Carmichael? Stokely Hathaway. There you go. He's looking for another baddie because Red Velvet's injured and we can't grieve forever. So they're filling her spot. He can talk. If he ever had top guys in any of these companies to work with instead of a girl's group or, you know, the fucking green diamond mine, I'd like to see what he can do. Um, Shivani's too hokey in this stuff. I have always thought he would be good well, in the interview role, but he acts too much like a fucking clown. Well, because, see, he didn't do that 30 years ago because Dusty or any of us would have fucking told him once and forcefully don't do that anymore. He had respect for the business. when he He's talked about when he first was allowed in the interview room at Crockett's office in, what, 1981, 82, when they first hired him. He knew he was seeing shit he wasn't supposed to see, and he knew instinctively because he was a fan that he should never speak of it and he respected the business he respected the boys and that continued through i didn't associate with him or wasn't around him during the wcw years but then he took 20 years off and now he's come back and he sees the guys laughing about wrestling being fake and the promoters laughing about wrestling being fake and obviously all of the nobody respects the business anymore. So he just laughs at the bad comedy because nobody else cares. He didn't do that on his own. He's been taught that that's okay by the jack offs that are working in this company. But Tony was with Chris Statlander and Ember Moon. And they were doing a promo, making fun of the promo that Jane Cargill and Malcolm Stokely or, Carmichael Bivens, whatever his fucking name is, they're making fun of the promo. It wasn't actually as bad as the girls' promos usually are here, but here's the thing. I'm going to mark this down. Chris Statlander, she's dressing like a human being now. She was announced from New York last week or two weeks ago instead of the Andromeda Galaxy. She has been apparently training since she was off injured again. And a lot of people have said she's improved. So the next time they put her in a single match with somebody that I'm not completely offended by, I'm going to watch and give her another shot because she's got the size. She looks like she's got the look. She's not a space alien anymore. I'll see what she... And also, did, did you see she can play the flute? Well, that was the recorder, not the flute. Well, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not up on my on your fourth grade music class. Stuff? My woodwind instruments yeah, or whatever. Right. Uh, but uh, she serenaded the folks on Twitter with a fine rendition of Wednesday night in the key demo, uh, instrumental version. She didn't sing it. And uh, but anyway, I'll reevaluate this now that she's a human. This was a good promo. I actually thought she was really good here in this promo because I don't remember ever really hearing her speak before. So I was like, all right, let's see where this goes because a lot of these women, like even some of the ones that come off WWE TV, they're not good talkers and they can't make it feel natural. Right. This feels like a girl being natural and getting in your face and she's going to kick your ass. Well, and Ember also, when they were joking back and forth, because normally, especially the AEW girls, we talk about it, they recite the lines with no emotion or they've memorized it and you can tell or it's... And the NXT backstage girl promos too are just horrible. But this, they have a, they have a rapport there, Statlander and Ember. Speaking of someone who doesn't have a rapport... Tony Storm versus Marina Schaefer. And now apparently the manager of Marina Schaefer is Nyla Rose. 
I get Vicky Guerrero's gone. We haven't seen Nyla Rose in months. She comes out in Marina's corner. Now she's her manager. Is this what we're being led to believe here? I guess so. This is the first time I saw it as well, and I was surprised. So I thought, okay, normally I like Tony Storm. But we know what we've got now with Marina Schaefer. So normally I wouldn't have watched this, but since all the controversy came up a couple weeks ago that Thunder Rosa was accused of sandbagging Marina Schaefer and not whatever and not cooperating with her and blah, 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 which we said was complete bullshit. Here's the problem with Marina. She's not only not smooth, not a a natural worker, not comfortable and going from one thing to another. She's one of these people. I'm trying to figure out how for for anybody that's never been in the ring or anybody that's never been in a training set, she jerks you. She doesn't lay her hands on you, grab you, and in a smooth motion convey through body language where you're supposed to be going. She grabs and jerks. And that's why Thunder Rosa couldn't figure out how to take the snapmare. Because she was grabbed and, and kind of pulled and thought that that was the, the mare. But no, that was just like, I'm jerking you to come out here and then I'm going to marry you. Well, she'd already started to go over. Or if somebody grabs you in a headlock, they're going to take you over. You can go over in one motion. But if they grab you and jerk you and then start to, you've already committed to going. Before they're ready, for, it's it's jerky. And Marina is jerky. And also, she's the complete shits. Because I watched this whole match. We know there's nothing wrong with Tony Storm. And this is three in a row. Tony Storm, Thunder Rosa, and whoever it was that we laughed about, my God. Jade. Jade. There you go. So... I mean, I, that doesn't mean that she's a horrible person and needs to be sent out on an ice flow like, you know, a fucking elderly Eskimo to be lost at sea. But it's not anybody else's fault that's in the ring with her. She's not good. She's not smooth. She's not comfortable nor confident because she probably knows that she's not good. And it doesn't look like that she naturally understands how this shit's supposed to look either, but that's just it. It's not Thunder Rosa or Tony Storm or anybody else. And Tony Storm won with a roll-up, which is probably the safest bet. And Nyla Rose comes in, and they start beating up Tony Storm, and here comes Thunder Rosa. And they beat up the heels. Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm, and then Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm have a stare down. We're noticing a pattern developing. Two heels will get on one baby face after the fucking match. Another baby face will come down. The heels will get the shit kicked out of them. The baby faces will then stare at each other like they want to fight. Every segment. Then we come to the other high point of this program. The one that left you in convulsions, Brian. Darby Allen and Sting in the pre-taped promo from the back. When you and I spoke the other day, before you had watched Dynamite, after I had watched it live, sometimes if there's something I just want to make sure you don't fast forward through, I'll mention it. <laughs> and I told you, I said, you know, I don't know if you would fast forward through a Darby promo, but please make sure you watch this because it made me laugh hysterically for way too long. Not on purpose, though. That wasn't his his mission. Darby didn't want to make people laugh. He just succeeded. And again, you know, and I'm I'm blistering this kid because now we know why they don't let him talk. He really can't. He's got no personality. He has no bass in his voice. He can't raise his voice. He sounds like a nasally little nerd, a skateboarder. But sometimes you don't need to talk too much. Especially if you're a baby face and he, you know, he's got that weird charisma, the appeal, people like to see him get thrown around. But this is the booking also. You take a guy who is not a strong promo to begin with, and then you tell him in this 60 second pre tape interview 
you have to plug your match on the behind the green door pay-per-view that we haven't even announced yet. This was a match. He was announcing this match because this wasn't part of the preview that we did last week, was it? You know what? I didn't realize. Was this match for the pay-per-view? I thought it was for Rampage. Was it for the pay-per-view? Well, I don't know, because I don't know what the fucking match is. It's Japanese, guys. Yeah, I'm not even yes, sure, and I watched no, it's it. The, it's the pay-per-view, because it's, it's, it's either a tag team match or an eight-man tag. See, here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't see this. Darby Allen tries to plug a match. And I believe it's a match that we're going to see on the pay-per-view, because there's a lot of New Japan people involved in it. And... What he, I can't, somebody with more time than I have needs to go back and transcribe exactly the words that he used. But from watching this one minute promo with Darby Allen promoting and plugging this match that he and Sting are going to be involved in, I now know the following. Nothing. I don't know whether it's a tag team match or an eight man tag. I don't know whether all of the names that we've never heard that he mentioned are his opponents or his his friends, his partners. We heard about Shingu and Urumu and Phantasmo and Hikaluo. So I, I, again, I, like I said, Brian, I think it's on a pay-per-view and I think it's an eight-man tag because a lot of names were mentioned. But I still don't know who's partnering with who. And he said, I'm bringing, we're bringing our guys because you're bringing your guys and whatever the fuck. But at the end, and that's where he said, and Kyle O'Reilly's not cleared, but we're going to have Phantasmo and Hikalulo, or is it, or are they going to have Shingu and Arumu? But it, it, once that you listen to this and just, if you sit down and try, if you say, I'm going to listen to this, because I listened to it twice. I'm going to listen to this, and all I want at the end is to be able to write down the people in the match that he's talking about. I couldn't. I don't know what the fuck it is. And all I know is these names, Tony Khan, with AEW and with this pay-per-view, has promised us a literal who's who of professional wrestling, and instead we've gotten a who's that. I wish somebody would hit me in the head so I could see some stars. Jim, I have this Darby promo you're talking about if you want Are to Are you it. serious? I'm can serious. We, can we play this without, we're trying, if Tony won't sue us, we'll play this and promote his pay-per-view, and let's see if we can figure out what the match is when it's over with. Here is Darby Allen and his escort, Sting. Undisputed Elite, you saw what we did to Bobby Fish on Rampage. Kyle, you say you're not medically cleared. I don't believe that for one second. I just think you're too afraid to show up this Sunday at Forbidden Door. So what are we going to have here? The Young Bucks and two members of the Bullet Club, El Phantasmo and Hikaleo, versus me and Sting. You think we're going to come alone? No, we got two members of our own. You want to get crazy, we can get crazy. <coughs> Shingo and Harumu. <coughs> and one by one, Undisputed Elite, we're going to take you guys out. And it continues this Sunday at Forbidden Door. We're going to keep kicking bodies down the hill, all the way down the freaking hill! Until there's nobody left. <laughs> Two down, three, four more to go. It doesn't matter to us. At Forbidden Door, it's going to be showtime. Well, there he now, is. Now, see right there, Sting tried to cover it because I assumed that he was lulled into a false sense of security when it was a tag team match in the first 15 seconds of the interview. But once that other people started showing up, now, is it an eight-man tag? We heard... I think so. ...a number of names there. Sting obviously couldn't figure it out, so he just decided he's going to kick some bodies down the hill. I've been watching this whole episode with just random New Japan guys showing up all throughout the episode, so finally they get this Darby promo. I'm like, all right, let's see what Darby says. Starts talking about Kyle O'Reilly. I'm like, all right. And then turns into everything else. Just starts shooting out names... We know a little, well, you don't follow Japanese wrestling at all, but I know a little more than, I guess, the average person who doesn't follow Japanese wrestling at all. The people at home have no idea who any of these names are. Shimu? Just throwing that at the people out there like they're going to care. 
I thought Hikalulo was one of those Hawaiian fucking dances that you did to the ukulele and the breeze. Oh, hello, Hikalulio. Hikalulio. All right. Thankfully, there's only one match left, Brian. And apparently, this was supposed to be a big deal. Chris Jericho and Lance Archer against John Moxley and Tanahashi. And that's supposed to be Moxley and Tanahashi is obviously the matchup that's going to take place to determine the interim AEW champion. So naturally, let's make them team up because Tony has seen in the past when he was a kid watching wrestling that smart bookers often did an angle out of that with the champion and the challenger. Unfortunately, this wasn't a smart booker nor one of those times. The match was different. You got to you got to admit that. They started it out with a jump start and a four way at the bell. That never happens on AEW. They're going in a completely different direction here. And then they continued to think out of the box, doing stuff that had never been done before. Moxley and Jericho had a sloppy fake looking fight on the floor. It's like half the time they don't even care the cameras on them when they're throwing the fake punches. And there was one of these brawls on this show. It was Adam Cole when he was in that Donnie Brook, where he was just, I've, I've hit people harder when I tap them on the back to ask them to turn around so I can tell me what time it is. But anyway, and then uh, uh, Tanahashi and Archer were in the ring while Moxley and Jericho were on the floor and Archer cut Tanahashi off immediately and then Jericho tags in when they settle it down, and Jericho beats up Tanahashi. Am I correct in assuming that this is Tanahashi's first time wrestling on an American promotions television? I'm not sure if he's done anything for TNA or ROH in the past, but this well, is certainly... Well, nobody would have seen that. Yeah, this is certainly his first ever mainstream wrestling appearance in the United States, sure. So in the first minute of this match, they couldn't have just rung the bell and started so that Tanahashi could do 30 or 40 seconds of spots that would make people think, wow, this fucking guy's good. Instead, they do a jumpstart sloppy four-way and then immediately cut off the only guy that we've never seen before and start kicking the shit out of him so he looks like a schlub. Well, I think part That's of the issue is there's, there may be a limited amount of what he can do at this point due to all the injuries he's had. Oh, good Lord. Another one? Is that, I thought that was Minoru Suzuki that has to be handled like a Fabergé egg. So now this guy's fucking broken down also. He can't do 30 seconds? Well, I'm sure he could have done something better than what they did. Okay, well, he that's is all broken I was going though. for. Yeah. You know, usually when I would bring in a big star into one of my companies from either just the general wrestling world or specifically another promotion, the first time that you see them on TV, they do two or three things to somebody else just to show they can. So then while the announcers were talking about Tanahashi being an all-time great, including Jim Ross, he's on my list of all-time greats, he was in the ring doing absolutely nothing to back up that verbiage or stand out in any way. And then Moxley got with Jericho and they went back out to the floor. What else does... You know what they ought to do? They ought to get one of those shock collars like they have the dogs, the hidden underground electric fence where it's it's dug underneath the ground and the, the invisible fence and then the dog wears the collar and tries to go over the... The barrier, it shocks them enough that they go back inside. They ought to put one of those on Moxley and put him inside the ring and make him stay there. So Jericho... You know, that's not a bad idea because my favorite Moxley match, surprisingly, was the one with him and Omega, the um, exploding ring match, even though there was no explosion. <laughs> just those two fighting and they wrestling had to stay over... In the ring. Having to stay in the ring was actually the best match I've ever seen him in. Did you see Jericho try to do the... The old uh, uh, Fabulous Kangaroos boomerang where they, he would try to boomerang Moxley's throat under the bottom rope. And Jericho didn't know how to give it. And Moxley didn't know how to take it. Both their, <laughs> their legs collapsed. Jericho bent his knees and fucking Moxley spread his legs out so his legs weren't even in front of Jericho's and it just was... And they went to a break, and they come back, and finally Tanahashi gets the tag for a blah comeback. 
I, seriously, he came in and punched one of the baby faces like a time or two. The guy never even, or one of the heels rather, the guy never went down. And then he started shooting him off and going into ducks and reversals. If you're a baby face and you get a hot tag that anybody cares about and you come in and you st- and your baby face starts re- or your heel starts reversing you and going into spots before you bump them two or three times, you've shat your comeback. Um, he did a senton on Jericho, got a two count. Did you see Jericho go for the double arm? He had a double arm grip like he was going to either suplex or pedigree the fucking guy, Tanahashi. And he gives Tanahashi the office on his back, a blatant Iggy. Like that. Two times on with both hands on his back and Tanahashi reverses it. it, it just, like, Mox and Archer went to the floor. And Jericho and Tanahashi laid in the ring and then did a sloppy one-two exchange. Not one Japanese wrestler can throw a punch. Tanahashi goes for the crossbody off the top. Jericho wanted to roll through, but he caught him and dropped to his ass and then did a shitty roll through and got the walls of Jericho and held it forever because he was looking around. Apparently Moxley forgot. And then finally Moxley comes back in and hits an RKO on him to take him out of it. And then nothing happened. And then and that is when I wrote, and I'm going to ask you this question, Brian. And I also bring this up to anybody out there that watched this television program or watches AEW on a regular basis and likes the Japanese wrestlers. Can you explain to me why that every time one of these guys debuts on AEW television, they look like shit. They don't do anything. They don't make an impact. They don't make a statement. They don't blow anybody away. Keith Lee, in his first job match on their TV, remember the one that he actually did right? He got over more than any of these supposed world's greatest wrestlers, Okada and Tanahashi and Hikalulo and the rest of them. They don't even look as good as the guys on the AEW roster. They dress like bums. They got no physiques. If they can work in some spectacular fashion, you don't see it. They're in multiple man matches. They're doing shit that looks bleh. Do they just not care? And they're just jacking off on Tony's dime? Or, shockingly enough, could it be that they're not really all that good? Unless they're working with each other in front of their audience with their bookers and in their company where they're over. Answer that question for me. I agree that there's not been any Japanese wrestlers I could think of that have had a really good debut or really impressed anyone. Usually it's riding off a reputation and having the announcers or at least two of them scream at you about how great the person is. And Jim Ross may chime in if he's seen them before. But, I mean, this New Japan thing. None of the people, including... I'm, I want to see Okada. Not in a four-way with those fucking guys. But I want to see Okada. He came out... And the Daniel Bryan, or the Bryan Danielson special, the white t-shirt, just looking like he's there. He seemed like another guy. Tanahashi, very special wrestler, just seemed like another guy. I think every one of these guys that have thrown on the show in the last few weeks has seemed like another guy. It would have been a lot more effective if, let's say, you had Okada, and you used him alone on TV for (laughs) several weeks, several months, built him up so that people would want to see him, because the whole pay-per-view is built around the idea that everyone already knows everybody. I know you can't fly Okada in from fucking Tokyo Airport every week, but... Tony could. Well, I mean, it would, and then would Okada want to do that? And I'm sure he's got commitments at home, but it doesn't even have to be several weeks. If you're going to introduce, supposedly, the best wrestler from or two or three of the best wrestlers from any other promotion, whether it be New Japan or Ring of Honor or any other invading, competing rival promotion, all you need to remember is the first time people see them, they need to win, and they need to look good. Because elsewise, you've brought an unknown person in that doesn't stand out of a pack, 
looks like everybody else and you're not even predisposed to like them as more any as much as you like the regular wrestlers on the roster because you at least know who they are and if you've heard the guy heard about the guy but you haven't seen him then you want to see 30 to 90 seconds at least of what makes him so spectacular and or a five or six minute match where he looks good and wins decisively this is just it so it it went on the match wasn't over i just wondered at that point why all these guys that are supposed to be so great don't show it and it's not just the booking if the guy's going to come in and and have a fucking match he can work out if he's able to do something he can work out a fucking 45 second spot with somebody where he looks good but he didn't if you're on national television in a brand new country and you get a chance to blow the people away and you come way far away from doing that, I'd say it's because you can't, not because you didn't want to. Uh, but anyway, simultaneous cold tags to Moxley and Archer. Moxley dropped Archer and tagged Tanahashi back in, and he gave Archer a stiff frog splash, which was the best thing that he did the entire match. And then... God damn... If you wanted to laugh at something stupid and ridiculous, okay, this television program and specifically this clothes would do it, but something to make you want to spend $50 on a pay-per-view? Come on. Moxley and Tanahashi start having a stare down in the middle of the ring, and they stare at each other for about 30 seconds. And then here comes Eddie Kingston, and Jericho's out there, and here comes Wheeler Useless, and here comes Minoru Suzuki, the fragile Japanese grandfather, and the Jericho appreciators, and Santana, and Ortiz, and Hager, and people we don't know, and security guys. And everybody had a sloppy fake fight on the floor that looked like it was everybody's first day in wrestling school and Moxley and Tanahashi just stand in the middle of the ring stock still while all this is going on around them staring at each other for my DVR froze because it was the end of the show when it had to have been two and a half minutes wouldn't it they just stood there it was ridiculous because every time they kept cutting back to them I was like how could they still be staring at each other it, it, because it doesn't matter whether it looks phony as long as they think it looks cool. Phony's fine. So, it, again, if you want to laugh at something that's silly, yeah, watch this particular television program in that last segment. To Anything that would make you want to buy the pay-per-view if you have not already decided to do so was not here on this broadcast. And... They need their injured talent back. And I'm thinking Tony is, he's got to be having a meltdown of some kind now because he won't let anybody knows how to do this, do it. He's got to do everything himself. It's been this way for three years now. He's just bought another promotion. He's changing his booking because he's got injuries. He's going to have a fucking stroke. A stroke or some kind of goddamn brain aneurysm or just a Herb Abrams meltdown without the hookers and then where are they going to be but this is falling apart at this point and you know it, i i think we could say from a distance looking at it that there have been noticeable changes and various things on the show since cody left if we're going to be fair and certainly the last few weeks Again, I don't think it was as much about Danielson. It's CM Punk and MJF. They're not there in this show. It's not even they just not, they're not on TV. It feels like every segment they touch is improved, which tells me that they're doing more than just appearing on TV. And that's needed right now because the people Tony's listening to, Jericho, the Bucks, Moxley, the New Japan people, look at the show the last three weeks. The show's been terrible, and the ratings went down significantly. Remember when All Japan and New Japan, between the two of them, and this was over a period of, what, 30 years from the late 50s to the late 80s, All Japan and New Japan imported 
the absolute best talent in America and put them all together on their rosters at a time when you couldn't see the best talent in America all together on a roster. They took from every territory the best guys, and you would see dream matchups, and you'd see the, the absolute best in the business. Every American working in a Japanese promotion now is an American that wasn't good enough to get a job in America. Because of, with the contracts now, they can't use WWE guys. They can use some AEW guys because they're working together, but that's only been a recent development. Every American working for New Japan and any other Japanese promotion that still exists at this point are guys that couldn't get fucking spots with the top promotions in America. So it's gone from the absolute best of America to what's left of American talent. And, and that's another thing. If I'm just a regular television viewer, and again, the reason why no regular television viewers watch AEW is because they make it so difficult to understand. But if I'm a regular television viewer, half the people that I see that are attributed to the New Japan Pro Wrestling roster aren't Japanese. Most of them are from Australia. What the fuck sense does that make to somebody? If you tell the average person, we're going to bring in the best wrestlers from New Japan Pro Wrestling to fight our wrestlers, they expect to see more Japanese wrestlers than fucking Australians and New Zealanders in that crew. But that's what they're left with in Japan because they don't have access. Not only is there not as much top American talent as there was in the territory days by far, but they don't have access to the ones that are the biggest names, the best draws, and the biggest talents. So that's why we get Ozzy Oldham and Great O'Conn. <sighs> and I could understand Okada and Tanahashi maybe getting some uh, people interested because of their previous altercations in, in New Japan that some people may have seen in this country. If people know about it, because even if, if people, you are someone, yes. they didn't, Okada wasn't there until this week on the show. Well, but that's what I'm saying is, you know, I can understand people being interested in the names and seeing them and say they've heard so much about them. And then they see them in this fashion, exposed in this way on the television program and go, well, those, those guys ain't any different than any of these other fucking guys. They were not more spectacular. They were not more technically sound. They were not, they didn't have bigger physiques or better looks or they didn't move faster. There was a difference 30, 40 years ago that you could see instantly in the top Japanese guys. And when they came in and, and worked on an American show, you could tell that Jumbo Tsuruda was the closest thing you'd find to a Japanese Terry Funk or Dory Funk Jr. Tiger Mask. Give him two minutes and fold your fucking tent. He'll outshine the whole roster. These guys just, eh. It's one of the problems where everyone wrestles the same nowadays, worldwide. And I don't know why they picked up that particular style to begin with, but uh, that's a story for another time. And this is a show for another time. So we're watching this? We're really watching this thing? I, do you know what? I, I, folks, on the drive through this week, if you want a blow-by-blow, blow, step by step description of, I believe now this pay-per-view is up to 10 matches, at least three or four of them are multiple person matches, and more than half of them involve people that we've never fucking seen before and are not really anxious to break that trend. So you might get a good recap of uh, the entire program and a couple of the matches in detail. I don't think we need to Go crazy over this thing. We'll have plenty of questions about classic wrestling and a few nippy, nippy tunes, some songs to make up for whatever, for behind the green door does not provide us in the way of entertainment. You think? How dare you disgrace the memory of Marilyn Chambers by associating her with this AEW New Japan cross-promotional pay-per-view? She was 99 and 44, 100% pure, I'll have you know. You know how embarrassed those people were? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I had one of those boxes for a year. My mom had get one of those boxes. Get out of here, really? <laughs> she used the product. <laughs> and then I wanted to keep it, but I, I was, what was I fucking, what was that? Name? I was 12, 13 years old. I didn't want her to know why I wanted to keep the box. So I kept putting it on the shelf behind shit, thinking that she won't notice it and I can sneak it out of the laundry room. And she ended up using it all and throwing it away. Hold on. How did you find out about who she was at 12 years old? That was when the movie came out. I understand you were 12 years old. Yes. You weren't going to porno theaters. I'm I'm doing a lot of reading. <laughs> porno reading? It was reading? in the newspaper. AVN? The magazines. Paul Fishbein? No, he wasn't around then. <laughs> no, that was, that was actually not... I don't think they put it on the front page of the New York Times, but yes, when Marilyn Chambers and Behind the Green Door... It was, what, just a couple months after Deep Throat. It, th that was the, the tag team of porn movies in the mainstream media was Deep Throat and Behind the Green Door. And The Devil and Miss Jones. That came a little afterwards, and it was definitely, that was third place. Everybody knew Behind the Green Door, and every, everybody even more knew Deep Throat. Linda Lovelace was on top. Marilyn Chambers was number two. Georgina Spelvin did not ever really attain the echelon of Linda Lovelace and Marilyn Chambers, but it was reported in the news that Marilyn Chambers, what was it, two, three years before she shot the Behind the Green Door, one of the first mainstream X-rated movies, she was a model that was on the cover of the Ivory Snow Box, the laundry detergent holding a cute little baby. We're very, very close to the lips that later on in Behind the Green Door would be attached to all sorts of different bodily orifices. And that, that box became valuable for a while. Which box? The... <laughs> you know that thing about Marilyn Chambers? She wanted to get in the wrestling business at one point. And they asked me what I thought about it. I said, well, I, I haven't seen her wrestle, but I have seen her box. All right, well, next week on the show, we will be reviewing Café Flesh and the opening of Misty Beethoven, so stay tuned for that. Whatever happened to Vanessa Del Rio? Could we find her and get an interview? Tashin, Tashin, who puts out these incredible and at times expensive, but beautiful art books. I have a massive collection of them. I don't know if I'm going to have this one, though. <laughs> they just put out a deluxe Vanessa Del Rio book set. Well... There you go. And a now coffee you... table book filled with the filthiest fucking photos <laughs> you've ever seen. <laughs> does, does it have little legs that, that fold out to, on the coffee table book to set to make it a coffee table? All right. That's a good idea. We're done with this program, correct? Oh, I think this part right here was the signal that we're over, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're over and done. <laughs> All right, over and out, 10-4, uh, Roger, Captain, over. We'll be back on the drive-thru to peek behind the forbidden door.